Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe Show and Tell. My name's Ed Piscor. My name is Jim Rugg. When you think of Joe Kubert, you think of like Sergeant Rock, Enemy Ace. He was a longtime editor at uh, DC Comics, and he ran one of the first uh, comic book kind of trade schools, uh, the Joe Kubert School of uh, Art and Design. I went there for one year, Dover, New Jersey, represent me. But uh, a lot of people don't know, for a time, a cup of coffee, as you say, he was a self-publisher. Had this comic, two issues, series called Sojourn, that has artwork by some amazing heavy hitters. Not to mention the uh, center spread feature would have been a very, very young Steve Bissett. So if you're a Steve Bissett completist, you don't have everything if you don't have these two issues of so Sojourn. Yeah, these, these were kind of a revelation for me. I'm very excited to get into the nitty gritty with these series because I had never heard of these uh, two weeks ago until you showed them to me, Ed. So... It's a pretty exciting project. When I was young, I always wanted to go to the Kubert School. Mm -hmm. I saw the ad with that one kid standing in the b-boy stance right next to Spider-Man with that Joe <laughs> Kubert sign in the back. You remember from yes. those 90s Marvel comics? I do. I showed that thing to mom and was like, what is this? I have to go. I thought it was like a send-away book. And she's like, oh no, that's like a college. She's like, okay, I gotta go there. And I would read interviews with Rick Veach, with Steve Bissett, mm -hmm. with Tim Truman. And Sojourn comes up in conversation in those comics journal interviews pretty routinely, man. So I was always on the hunt for these things, but I knew that they uh, they didn't receive the widest distribution, which aided and abetted their only being two issues. So earlier in this week, I actually, this happens to me quite often, I forgot I'm in comics. <laughs> <laughs> so I was able to like contact Steve Bissett we had about a two and a half hour conversation, all things Sojourn, all things uh, Joe Kubert School, all things process when it comes to Sojourn, distribution. So we're going to be able to lay it all out on the table once we put this thing under the microscope. So Jim, there would be no Sojourn if it wasn't for this guy called Ivan Snyder. And Ivan Snyder is the dude who owned the Heroes World comic stores that were around at the early days of the direct market, which eventually becomes the distributor that Marvel uses in the 90s to be their sole distributor to, to comic shops. The uh, beginning of the end. <laughs> the beginning of the end, to <laughs> say the least. Now, Snyder worked for Marvel early on and created like a kind of like mail order business for with merchandise and all, all, all that sort of stuff. And, and eventually, Marvel kind of got rid of that part of the business, like when K it changed hands from Cadence to whoever. So he had his own business, and that's where Heroes World comes up, mostly based in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. I think there was one like not far out of outside of Philly, Snyder, once a year, would solicit the kids from the Joe Kubert School to, uh, to design the catalogs. Now, I had a two and a half hour conversation with Steve Bissett about all of this because I'm a big uh, QB aficionado. I dig into all this kind of thing, and I wanted to know the full scoop, man, and that's what this vid is about. Now, you would see, you see the names, Bissett, these are all the first-year kids, Ben Ruiz, like Rick Veach. They did several of these catalogs. Yes. Four, I believe. Ultimately, they were like, Joe, we don't want to do any more catalogs. We're done with They, they weren't <laughs> making money. And eventually they said that they wanted paid. And, and Steve gave me this anecdote about like they put together like the fourth catalog. And uh, Joe calls them down into, into his office. There it is right there, man. Calls them down into, into the office. And this Ivan Snyder guy is there and palms Steve and Rick. Five dollar bills, man, for you know months worth of hardcore labor. They would get photo stats of some of these tchotchkes, and they would be photo stats of photo stats that got peeled up a million times. They had to redraw things. They had to freehand design the Star Wars logo. I want to call attention as you're flipping through here to just like the incidental lettering, you know, because this is almost like lettering that you would see like uh, in comics of that period, cover lettering, blurbs, things like that. It's so good. You know, like from a lettering standpoint, it's so good. Shouts to High Eisman, the lettering teacher at the Joe Kubert School. He was even there when I was there, man. It's very enjoyable to flip through these. Uh, these are these are books that I've picked up through dollar, you know, bin diving, and they are fun to flip through. A lot of this advertising stuff would also, not in these catalogs, but a lot of the ads that you would see in comics would often be done by bullpenners and stuff like that. So you would get to see, like, real comic book artists, but just kind of dashing out, you know, a picture of a action figure or t-shirt design or whatever, whatever these products are. When you go through these things, you get to see that Joe draws all the fun stuff <laughs> and then the, the kids have to like paste 
these gimmicks up and do all the real heavy lifting, man. All the bitch work, as we say. Yeah, that part would not be fun. Yeah, like uh, having to redraw that tiger. Come on now. <laughs> but we're really here for Joe's self-published work called Sojourn. And I believe he did it in partnership with Ivan Snyder. And this is the thing. It's before Joe... Or excuse me, it's before uh, Heroes World was a distribution mechanism. I guess the idea, like even Steve was a little unclear on what the approach was going to be to like get these books across the country. It's from the, from every sound of it, it seems like Heroes World was going to be like the monopoly in Sojourn. That didn't quite work out very well for these guys. Now you and I in a past episode, we talked about the death of the comic book and like the comic book pamphlet size as like a fetish object mm -hmm. and it's kind of dying. In fact, when I was talking with Steve Bissett, who is a teacher at the Center for Cartoon Studies, he said this is the first year, this class that he's teaching now in, uh, you know, winter, spring of uh, 2019, he would always ask at the very beginning of class, how many people read comic books, meaning direct market comic books? First time in the 15 years of the school that not one single hand was raised, man. So it's going away. But before the comic book, there was the broadsheet Sunday funnies. And the way that we fetishize this, right. Joe Kubert fetishized the broadsheet Sunday funnies. And we should say his whole generation. Because sure, there are other yeah. examples of this type of production and scale and it all, if, if you read interviews, like all of them cite those broadsheets as being, you know, memories of Sunday morning comics as being a big piece of that. That's a really good analogy, Ed. You know, comic books to us is what the broadsheet Sundays were to these guys. Now, you see, even when it's folded, it's a problem for these comic shops. To, to this day, there are shit-ass comic shops, I'll call you bitches out, <laughs> who will not stock books that deviate from the standard comic size. And books have been have been printed in all variations for many, many years. But there is a certain kind of fan, not a kayfaber, but there is a certain kind of comics reader that wants this and nothing else. So that's strike one against Sojourn. It's too odd a size. It's too weird uh, for many comic shops to... Uh, to deal in this thing. Yeah, I get mad at the off-size books won't be carried by a comic shop, but the reality is they also don't historically hold up because where are you going to put them? Right. You know, so like I never see Sojourn whenever I'm back issue diving because it doesn't fit in a comic book box. Fooey on the shops that won't order it, but practically speaking, these aren't in my back issue boxes either. We're talking 1977. We're talking the, the earliest days of the direct market. So... So, so Joe wants in, you know, he wants in on, on these, uh, these, these comic shops and he wants to get something that's a little different than what was on the racks at the time. Kind of wants to bring back the adventure strip. That's kind of what this idea is here. Yeah. And I would also add, you know, Joe Kubert's a guy who has demonstrated thinking outside of the box in, in other ventures, also working outside of the superhero genre. You know, I mean, he's done Hawkman and he's, he's done superhero comics, but he has done lots of war comics. He has worked as an editor. He starts a comic book school, and now here he is in the beginning of the direct market, self-publishing in order to you know, participate in this new model. So a lot of cartoonists, traditionally, they have a role, and that's what they do. Joe Kubert's a guy who, you know, again and again, has sort of tried something new, pushed the boundaries, experimented. We see this rose gallery of uh, contributors. It's quite a list. 1977, uh, Dick Giordano was an inking teacher at mm -hmm. the Kubert School. Uh, I'm not one, of, sure. one of the great Neil Adams inkers. Totally. And I believe uh, Lee Elias had some uh, vested interest in, this, in the school at the time. Not, not 100% sure. He taught uh, at times at the School of Visual Arts. So he had some teaching experience. And I don't know whether he taught at the Kubert School, but he certainly may have been in some advisor role or talked to Joe about you know a school of comics and how that works. Once again... Steve Vassett is the highlight of the thing, so we'll save that for later. You know, Steve is a student at the Joe Kubert School at the time. In conversation, he said that while they were there at the school in 1977, he got a copy of Fantasy Quarterly with the first appearance of, uh, you know, ElfQuest. He got the first uh, issue of Cerebus, like, while he was going to school there in Jersey, man. So it's all happening right then and there in tandem with the teachers like Dick Giordano. Uh, in fact... I could uh, run down the list because Kubert was going to edit 
a line of like four new kinds of titles for DC. Ragman by Joe Kubert and Bob Kaniger. There was going to be a Doug Wildey comic that was um, like some sort of like safari tigers animal comic. Doug Wildey's a guy. I, I dig his comics. Best known because he was like the key animator, designer, creator of Johnny Quest. You know, so he was one of these guys that went back and forth between animation and comics. This one is noteworthy because he draws this first story and it's beautiful. Uh, I'm a big Doug Wildey fan. His comics history is sort of hit and miss because he comes and goes. You know, right. he doesn't have a lot. Um, this is another work that I often see of his. Rio, some of his earliest comics were westerns. This is a newer piece published by Kamiko. Dark Horse also did some Rio comics by Doug Wowdy. Uh, but he was just a guy that really stood out to me as being exceptional in his draftsmanship and in his cartooning. And so a couple of examples that you might find somewhere. Um, pretty cool that Joe Kubert brought him into this. You know, like, I don't know... Just friends from from long time back. Like the comics industry was it was a small group of people making a whole lot of work. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought this example because another book that uh, or magazine that Kubert was very well aware of at this time by going to Angoulême and and other French festivals, he knew about Mattel Arlant, and he you could find videos from the 1970s those Tic Attack uh, drawing things where. He's mm-hmm. he's drawing these amazing things with Mobius and Neil Adams. And this and the reason I brought it up was because this is very reminiscent of like a Lieutenant Blueberry kind of kind of album. Absolutely. And that's going to fa- factor into our story as as we continue here, man. But uh you know Dick Giordano was going to do uh an issue of this uh, he was going to have a series of this like Joe Kubert edited line at DC and that all that stuff was getting cut. Teachers at the Kubert School would be coming, uh, you know, to class puffy-faced because they just uh, lost their jobs. Guys like Steve, who are there at the very beginning stages of the direct market, they then realize we're going to have to try a different approach. Like, we're in school learning to become cartoonists, and our teachers are being fired right now. Like, we got to figure some shit out, man. Yeah, there was that, um, like, a calling in D.C. where a lot of books were canceled That's, that was at a that part one of that. time period. Yeah, that was uh, all that. You know, and, and you think that's part of the necessity and the rise of the direct market. For a long time, the direct market was credited as saving comic books because they were non-returnable, as it made it, you know, more profitable for these publishers if they knew what they could sell, basically, before they put in their print orders. So a lot of stuff confluences at that time. But you could see here, man, like basically everybody who did comics in here, they were fans of the broadsheet Sunday funnies trying to bring back the adventure strip. You have some primo uh, John Severn right here. And then there would be that supplemental material, like uh, if, if this would have went gangbusters, they would have needed special postage rates, and there were rules uh, set aside to get those special postage rates. One of the things you had to do was have some like editorial kind of content. That's so interesting, Ed. I would have never put that together, but I think like old comics had the same deal. Like yeah. If you look at you know comics from the 50s, they often will have a couple of text pieces, right. and it had to be for the same reason. Yeah, Postal exactly. Regulation. Yeah. So whenever I was reading this, uh, it made me think of Jim Steranko's comic scene and media scene. So this is self-published uh, under his Super Graphics imprint, but it's that same sort of concept, you know, the same fold and everything. It's a little bit more text heavy, although there are some comics and illustrations spread throughout these. It seems like this is a possible template. I, you know, I'm sure Kubert and you know, would have been familiar with this, you know, Jim Steranko starts in the early 70s. I'm not sure how long it publishes, but I think into the 80s. Yeah, I so, think it went around for a while. You know, this 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 was something that uh, kind of stood out to me whenever I was looking through Sojourn is some similarities to some of the stuff Jim Steranko had done and was doing. Is this Kubert? I mean, is this, is this yeah. Steranko art? Yeah. Yeah, you can see his, his signature down here. Oh, yeah, man. So it's kind of neat to see, like, how these guys are all thinking. And the film crossover also present in comic scene and media scene is present in both of these in the editorial pieces. And I found that interesting because it is related to, you know, trying to teach visual storytelling and, and what can we pick up and, you know, what's in common there. Lee Elias, Kronos. Lee Elias is a guy that goes back to the 50s, kind of a golden age guy, really good with a brush pen. When I saw his name on here, I was excited. He's a guy that I will look at on eBay, look at his originals and stuff. He's done comic strips and very good in black and white. 
Kayfabers, I said it before, I'll say it again, man. When you see a new independent comic that has uh, the subscription model set up from the beginning, man, very rarely do any of these uh, subscriptions come to fruition and uh, good luck trying to get your money back. Pretty expensive book, I I'll add. You know, this was $1.50 in a time when comics were probably a quarter. That's not, uh, that's not helping yourself in terms of trying to launch something that's very different. Probably strike two. Here's the Doug Wildly piece. But can we show off Generation 1 Kubert student? Absolutely. All-star yes. piece right here, Please man. Please do. When I talked with uh, Bassett, I said, Steve, man, it's like you were the penthouse, the, you know, the, the Playboy Playmate of the month, man. You got the color center spread of this thing, man. And I asked him some particulars. One, did you draw this thing twice up? Like, did you draw it the same size? He said that he did draw it uh, the same size as this thing. He used uh, Doc Martin dyes. He used a little bit of pastel, maybe for stuff like this. And he also used some colored pencil. You could see mm -hmm. that there. At the Kubert School, uh, one of the great things about having access to Joe is when your drawing is kind of getting away from you, the, the old man would throw down that tracing paper and rework some of your figure work, man. And uh, Steve remembers that that Joe uh, helped helped out a lot with this figure right here. That's cool. So this is called Kingdom of Ma of the Maggot. And uh, what Steve was trying to uh, convey here is just like he wanted he wanted all movement. He wanted it to feel like it was like a super kinetic like action sequence. And what what are what like one of the best ways to convey motion in a static image? Curves, man. And that's like one thing you see is just so many curves that you know keep you tied into the entire composition I was gonna say directional devices that are constantly moving you around this composition and he colored it with the uh, like the blue line method though he said he probably it was a, probably a gray line a very faint gray mm -hmm. but uh for those unfamiliar they would sh make a photostat of the black line art and then that black line art would also be put onto like an acetate layer so that that acetate layer with the black line art could be laid over top of the board where Steve is doing like all of his color work. I asked him, Steve, man, what made you so fucking special? And he said, on one hand, Ed, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea, but I was done with these fucking catalogs and I was, I jumped at the chance <laughs> to have that opportunity. And they were the good students. You know, in that first year of Kubert School, uh, the, the, the standouts would be uh, Tom Yates, Rick Veach, and Steve Bissett. The very next year would be Total Ben, Ron Randall. And then the year after that, I believe, is, uh, is Tim Truman, Kim DeMolder, Tom Mandrake, J Jander Zima. But uh, Yates and I think even Veach say that uh, after Bissett came to the school, Joe Kubert's drawing changed. And Steve, Steve... Uh, you know, Steve heard this and he didn't expand on it much more. He said, you should talk to Tom. You should talk to Rick about that because like Steve being modest says that like he, he doesn't see what they mean by that. But Joe clearly took a shine to young Steve Bissett, who this is for all intents and purposes, we could call this Bissett's first printed work because there was one or two things before that had to do with uh, his, his college, his state college before this. 200 copies of those things were made like you're I, never going to find those i often whenever we're looking through these different books that we pull out talk about how like early efforts i enjoy them because it's usually like the guy just kind of bursting with ideas yeah it's incredible to think this is that early in steve Bissett's career and what's he doing whenever he gets this experimental form now he's making these full color works they're poster size there's a narrative that's involved. You know, there's a text piece that goes with each of these. This is supposed to be a series that goes on through subsequent issues that will also be poster sized. How ambitious, you know, like who even thinks of this? Most guys wouldn't think of this now, let alone 1977, a student. I just find that inspiring, amazing. And, you know, looking at it here, like whenever we, you were asking, why does Steve Bissett get this gig? In my mind, I'm thinking, well, I bet a lot of those dudes they're not interested in working color or they don't know how to work in color or whatever. So you get this young, ambitious guy who's willing to go all out and try something. And it's, it's pretty remarkable, you know, like in an, in a new formatted book, this is the thing that stands out to me as being like, wow, this dude really pushed it. So when the direct market becomes a thing, Bissett, you know, got hold of first service, 
He got hold of, through Bud Plant, I believe, some of those Metal Erlant magazines from France. But then he was a month-in, month-out subscriber to National Lampoon. And in one issue of National Lampoon, there's a promotional piece in there for a new magazine that they were going to begin publishing called Heavy Metal. Joe was already, once again, familiar with Mobius, all that stuff, and saw the kids starting to bring in the heavy metals to class. And that is what Joe is kind of like going for. Certainly with this is like, if you take a look at the um, cover for Heavy Metal number two with the Mobius painting, it's almost the same composition in a way with this character. There's no female there, man. But I figured we'd give this a quick flip through. Oh, geez. Do you know who colored these covers? It might have been Joe himself. Okay. He could sling some of that Doc Martin dies with the best of them. I feel like you're wrestling this thing, you know? know. It's, <laughs> these formats are really interesting, but they're not always that practical for, for reading and handling. And you get more of the same, man. You get like a primo piece of a tour silent comic. Not to mention Sergio Aragones doing his own thing, man, without fucking Mark Avanier. Pretty fun strip, too. This is about a girl private eye, and she's looking for the Maltese Falcon. And in the first installment, last issue, uh, the guys don't believe she's the P.I. Like, she kind of has to prove herself by basically kicking their ass. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's pretty progressive, I think, 1977. One thing I'll say about Doug Wildey, and I don't know how well it shows up here, there's a lot of this, like, gray screen tone, zip -a tone There's a lot of moray patterns emerging here and i don't know what that is if it has to do with the size of the reproduction no or... no 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 he's he's ganging up the zips so like he'll put the same he'll put the same screen down uh two times and then he'll he'll get that because this is printed at at this at to size so he's trying to get like a texture like for her fabric or whatever and that's what he's doing putting down this the cutting from the same sheet and just kind of arranging that stuff. I think he's doing it for like for effect. Mm -hmm. But let's go to the next Kingdom of Maggot piece, man, before we split. There it is, man. Let's just feast our eyes on this for a second, man. Uh, talking with Steve, there were plans for a third issue. We saw the subscription box. This was going to be a, a big deal, man. He was more than halfway done with the drawing for the poster for issue three, when Joe came into uh, his room, kind of kind of solemnly said, like, uh, pencils down, man, we're going to pay you for all the work that you've done. He said that they all got paid really good rates, too. But uh, Sojourn is uh, is no more, man. When I see this stuff and think again, it's very young Steve Bissett. His style is so formed already at this point. You know, I, I was a huge fan of Tyrant in the 90s, big fan of his Swamp Thing work in the 80s. A lot of that is is visible here. You know, it's it's pretty incredible to me because he has a fairly unique style and it's formed. Like he showed up at the Kubert School, I guess, with a lot of that style in place. He cites uh, Joe, he cites Sam Glansman, and mm -hmm. he cites Greg Irons as his inking heroes. By the way, I don't think we'll ever find anybody who could ink a burlap sack as good as this right here. Like, how do you even accomplish that? It's weird to spend 30 seconds on it, but boy, is that texture perfect. <laughs> I never thought I would see this second issue because you could imagine that after issue one, it's all downhill in terms of uh, circulation. Uh, I call attention to this page, the spread. This is the Dick Giordano story. Sci-fi, you know, it's set in some alien planet, and they're they're getting ready to like. She's putting together a team for her ship to do some kind of trade or adventures, and I just love like some of the the panel layouts. It feels very sci-fi sci to me. You know, it's a very attractive layout, and it makes me think about Dick Giordano, who we know as an editor and as an inker primarily. But yet, like th these are good-looking pages. It surprises me that he's that he would be known primarily as an inker. You know, and it makes me wonder if that was by choice or if he actually was considered not as, you know, I mean, like Neil Adams probably isn't the guy to compare him to, but whatever a typical penciler is, it feels like these are good looking pages. If he wanted to do that, I don't know what would stop him. And I was even looking at like all these panels are rounded corners. That's a pain in the ass. Yeah. You know, like that's going above and beyond. It is so much easier to make square corners and, you know, they're neat and perfect on all of these. So... He's he putting in the work there. He has Steve Jobs aesthetic, man. No hard edges. And I think it's worth noting that, uh, you know, he, Dick Giordano, was a part of the Star Reach crew and, and did sci-fi strips in there. And Steve Bissett 
will go on almost immediately, maybe even the same year, to do um, little strips here and there in heavy metal. Yeah. So Star Reach is like a companion piece, I, I, I would say, to to a sojourn. And uh, this this like kind of bridges the gap from those early days, but they're all still very bleeding edge. And the unfortunate thing about bleeding edge uh, is that uh, there will be blood. This is one of the casualties of the early comic book direct market when uh, there were an untold amount of possibilities of like what could have been considered comics, what could have been in stores because they didn't have to abide by that standard magazine format. But uh, like everything else, man, evolution, even in magazines and book sales, slow to change. This article is about Roger Corman. It's, it's another uh, editorial or text piece on filmmaking. Previous issue had Bruce Dern, who was part of that um, American International Pictures, AIP. It was like the Roger Cor- Corman shop, you know, known for putting out cheap products. And that's not by Steve Bissett, but again, it's one of his interests. Totally. You know, like I've read a lot of movie reviews by him online and, and t- it's stories about going to see like triple features and things at drive in So before the internet, it's interesting to me the culture that is like collected and shared among these small groups of creators and artists and things. You know, we've seen it with some of the alt cartoonists in the 80s. You know, it seems like the tastes all point in certain directions, even though it probably wasn't that easy to organize all of this or to track down all of this information. Steve said that, uh, you know, those early days when a film might show up in a local theater, old movie or whatever, it might be your only chance to ever see the damn thing. So he said that he would commit these uh these films to memory, and that is what informed his compositional approach when it came to drawing, and it's definitely something very specific that he brought to these posters. He was thinking movie posters. That kind of art was some maybe even a little bit more inspiring to him than a lot of the comic art at the time, and he said that the secret hack to get your hands on those posters, because you could not buy those, there was no store to get those things, but you would buy the movie soundtrack, man, and you get that album cover, and that's where you could like pour over those uh, the, that poster artwork. That's a great point, especially with the stuff like Roger Corman and these low-budget movies. It was more important to have a good poster than what the movie looked like. Yeah, Because that's how you would sell the tickets and actually make a little bit of money. That's for sure, man. So you, uh, Steve Bissett, complete us out there. You, Joe Kubert, complete us out there. Your, your, your collection is not complete if you don't have these two copies of Sojourn. You can find them. They float around on, on eBay. Uh, this is probably the first show and tell of many where we show some weird odds and ends of the early days of the comic book direct market. So stay tuned for future show and tells. Jim and I have to get back to making comics, so you guys know what to do. You Like, subscribe, follow the YouTube channel, hit the bell icon so that you can be notified whenever we have new videos available. You can find our latest t-shirt designs, hats, mugs, all of that merch in our spread shop, link below the video. Jim and I are going back to making comics, but you guys know what your marching orders are. Read more comics.